All right, so in this episode, I'm very, very lucky to be joined by a friend of mine that I've only known through the internet for the past year and a bit now, I'd say. Yeah. And it's kind of been a long time coming. Megan, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Very busy at the moment, but, you know, finding my feet in the graduate world, I suppose, yeah. Uh, are we all? Yeah. I feel like after, like... After undergrad, it just felt like a massive what now. I think everyone unanimously feels that, but <laughs> definitely, yeah. Jesus, like I don't know how I don't know how some people are coping, but all I knew was I needed to find something quickly. Mm-hmm. Whereas some people feel like feel so calm about everything they can take their time. So, how's it been for you? So you mean the transition to like graduation and then now? Yeah. So, um, for me, I graduated, I'll tell you a bit about, like, the uni and what I majored in and stuff like that, Um, but I went to basketball uni, I majored in psychology, and I really enjoyed uh, my degree, and I, it it definitely took me a while to find my feet at university, Um, and then as soon as I found, you know, my uh interests my research interests and i was really like knowing how to write essays and get the grades i wanted i it was like oh you're done now you're you're ready to leave you know um and obviously we had the quite unique experience of studying during the covid-19 pandemic so obviously i feel like i didn't really i wasn't on campus enough I feel like I I left uni on such a high but I felt like there was more that I wanted out of uni because we didn't have the full experience but right now I'm finding that um, not only academically but my personal life has changed quite a lot um, from leaving uni and also um, I'm doing a different course now I'm doing the level two and three counselling and psychotherapy course. Um, So I'm finding that that content is very different to um, my psychology major, as it's all about counselling and like reflecting on yourself, talking about yourself a lot, which is completely different to uh, undergraduate or a lot of uh, graduate essays it's not written in the first person it's kind of it's you're not supposed to talk about you know yourself um so yeah I'm finding it a massive challenge but I think it's super fulfilling um so yeah but I'm definitely still finding my feet and finding um new things out about myself which you don't get through an undergraduate degree that's more of the working with people and the practical application of my studying um in counseling so yeah right and you mentioned how studying counseling you have found you found a kind of a unique change and it's gonna it's had this transition from you kind of not used to talking about yourself and I feel like that's very similar to journalism in a very funny way because the whole thing is tell the story, don't beat the story. And you're dealing with, oftentimes you're dealing with people at their most stressful or their most, you know, sad or emotional. And I'd say within journalism, I had a lecture literally yesterday, two days ago, that really made me think of this. And it kind of showed that there's a culture within or at least within certain industries, especially journalism, where people kind of just brush it under the rug, like traumatic things, like co- like death knocks, for example, where you mm-hmm. where you knock on someone's door after they've lost a relative to something tragic, and you ask them for comments. And it, from that lecture, I got the impression that there's this large culture of dismissive behavior, dark sense of humor, alcohol, kind of finding anything else to drown out the noise rather than dealing with it. From the yeah. perspective of someone who is into who is in psychology, how does that is that healthy? <laughs> like, and well, is it healthy to approach someone you know when they've when they're going through a bereavement? Is that 
no, that's what we have to do anyway. That's like, what you have to do, yeah. Because, like, if someone was murdered in your local town, the job of the journalist would be to go over there and mm. get the story. Oftentimes, we have to see the tragic event and be the filter for the rest of society. So before it goes out to you in your newspaper or news broadcast, we have to been there, get to know the scene, find people to talk to mm. and get comments. And my question more pertains to the newsroom itself, the environment in which we're told the stories we have to go for. Mm. Well, I would say there's two aspects of that. The, the element that, sorry, the way I'm coming at that question is there's the journalists themselves obviously that have to um, go and be of witness to distressing situations and then there's also the um, people who have actually witnessed that if their son daughter x x y and z has been murdered right so i'd say like ethically speaking um there are many issues with that because obviously you're speaking about very sensitive topics but then i think there are ways to mitigate that for the for it you know if you're having an interview it's about you know connecting with them in a way that isn't trying to just find the facts trying to you know be with them and understand in the present moment and also I think from my perspective if I'm interviewing or if I'm really interested in what someone's going through I um I just think it helps to let them uh, find the narrative of their own conversation but then I understand that that is hard for journalism but overall I would say it's not ethical if you do it in the wrong way I think there's ways of approaching sensitive topics um, with you know if you're having that interaction with someone um, yeah and I guess like being aware of what's happened before you speak to them so that you know what touchy subjects may be around with them but I would say overall um you know ethically yeah probably many is many issues could arise but there's ways of mitigating that I think yeah I agree with you in the sense of I feel like it's a generational thing because a lot of the journalists I'm currently being lectured by in my master's degree it is they're very much standoffish they separate the person they are outside of work and the journalist they are and from the newsrooms they've came up and it from the impression i've gotten it feels like it's this idea of you you don't really talk about it unless you see something that's really graphic you don't really talk about it and i feel like that is going to change slowly as more of my more of our generation because we're roughly the same age more of our generation goes into the media industry and journalism in general so you mentioned how there's coping mechanisms and best ways of handling things and I kind of felt that that when I heard this information, I had to have my first lecture on trauma or whatnot. It kind of gave me this feeling of understanding why we have to know so much law and ethics and whatnot. But then yeah. also the sinking feeling of if you mess this up under any circumstance, you've not only irreparably damaged your own reputation, but you've mm -hmm. hurt the other person beyond repair because they've just had to spill out their trauma and you've messed it up some way somehow. Mm -hmm. So going back to your point about um, coping mechanisms. So within newsrooms or even within psychology, talk to me about the coping mechanisms you have as someone who's in psychology and the coping mechanisms you think would work in a newsroom in journalism. Okay, so um, in my counseling course at the moment, we have gone over personal professional boundaries, which has been a massive wake up call for me personally. Um, and I feel like in the setting that I work in and what I study, it is very easy to take, uh, well, I wouldn't say easy, but there is the risk of hearing information and a, trying to problem solve, um, because some people, when they, if they're in a counselling session or a helping session, they don't always want their problems to be solved. Some people just want someone to talk to and then they leave. Or one day they might want to, to help, you know, you to help them find a way. 
so I think there are for me personally I make sure that when I am with in the role play sessions with the other students I make sure because sometimes you know it is a very reflective course and we do speak about sometimes our personal things that we're going through obviously there are limits to that um, and we have to respect each other's boundaries because we we are helpers at this stage we're not qualified so we can't share too much with each other but just general things um, and you know it's about being present with that person and not letting your brain kind of attach your self to that um situation and it's interesting what you said about you know leaving you know yourself behind as a journalist and then going in as you know a different person kind of thing or just like not attaching the self with your work as you're saying that some people do that and with counseling there's the fine line between you know counseling is about bringing your own personality to the sessions but also remaining objective and having that professional boundary professional relationship with the client so i think personally it's a massive tree of things that help you not kind of take that home as it were but i think it's also a really important you know thing a lot of people that you know some people that go into certain work certain industries it's because they're interested it's because maybe they've had an experience or you know in journalism you like the structure or you like you know the kind of personal interactions and things there's loads of reasons why people go into careers so for me i find you know really rich conversations or not even rich just knowing that i'm there for someone is ma is just massively fulfilling so i think it is just remaining professional and realizing actually you know i'm not talking to this person i'm not befriending them they're not my friend that we're a professional relationship so i think if you're going to apply that to you know the newsroom journalist setting i would say um it's about you know i would i would argue but that's because i work and i study in this way but you can bring some of yourself to the point where you're empathizing and you're present with that person but don't you know there needs to be that professional boundary where you know your intentions with that person um, because for you you're ultimately getting facts out of them but if you add a little bit of empathy a little bit of you know your own personality to that it's a lot more of a rich open dialogue but then remaining professional and having those boundaries is also important but I would also like to add that it is okay for things to bother you like we're only human at the end of the day you know you're gonna you're we're all gonna even if we're not in a setting where we might hear traumatic information we may we're everyone's going to experience it in their life to a certain degree so I think it is about having it is about bringing that self a bit but also knowing when actually this you know I'm gonna not I'm gonna not take this or I have taken this who can I reach out to and I think um for me when I continue in my career I will have a therapist a therapist will have therapists so within my area I have a lot of support um but for journalism, I would say that's quite an interesting area of actually, who do you go to when you've been hearing this information and you have to plonk it down for, for other people to read to show awareness? There's ways of ethically being a journalist, arguably. But, um, <laughs> right, but um, just because I don't know, I don't know fully that world, but I would say um, learning those personal and professional boundaries it's really important and knowing that you can actually be bothered by something and knowing who to reach out to if that is the case I think um, that is how I remain um, kind of I keep myself well mm. in my job I understand that firstly there are ethical ways of being a journalist I'll say that now okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not wrong I feel like that leads me on to a large conversation where because of the ease of access to media, the ease of access to content creation and 
anyone can jump on Instagram, Twitter, whatever they have, upload a video, upload some viral tweets, and suddenly they're an authority on the topic or there's someone people gravitate to for content or information or whatever else have you. And I feel like because of that and the fact that that's an ever-growing thing that you have to deal with, less and less people are able to understand legacy media, able to understand like journalism and what we do. And yes, we... I think in my generation or our generation, we are going to bring ourselves as people to our job because that's what brings the best stories. That's what gets you to be the best. If you're on some level personally invested, it could be the most boring dry news day where there's no real stories like coming at you. But if it's something that interests you, if there's someone that their story interests you, you're going to go there and cover it with a bit more, like a bit more pep in your step because now you relate to this or you see the importance and why it makes sense beyond just ticking a box. And I feel like the change from the old God to the new God from, you know, whatever the name of the previous generation was to Gen Z is this idea of we're always going to be ourselves. You can never truly be objective because then journalism is a very boring, very dry thing to do. And the idea of going and saying, Hey, I need help. Or this is a lot for me to take in it's less of a you know like it's less of a taboo subject thankfully in our generation the whole topic of mental health and the effects that triggering stories might have and even non-triggering stories on some people where i remember after that lecture and uh, we all just a lot of us had sat down in a relatively large group and just kind of discussed how we were feeling the whole week and how just bottled up everyone had about different feelings and different things that they felt about the course and how they felt just in general be becoming journalists slowly but surely and mm. i feel like with our generation there's going to be this level of obviously there's profession and there's ethics you have as a journalist but you're always going to bring who you are who you are is going to be there in every story in every yeah. in every post you have professionally or personally and everything you do you're representing yourself and the publication you work for and like you said, very similar to counseling, it is this thing of, yes, I'm going to be myself, but I'm also, I've also got to remember the fact that, hey, I'm here to get the story at the end of the day. And they do encourage us to have a strong level of empathy, especially for death knocks, because you are literally there at the worst moment of someone's life, having to ask probably the worst set of questions imaginable, because I literally had a conversation with my dad just now and it was kind of, it was almost awkward for me to explain the fact that one day, God forbid, like some, like someone could very well knock on your door and be like, mm. someone in your family's died, you know, can we get some questions? And they even tell us to pre- prepare for, you know, people to slam the door in your face, which is a completely valid response and or for them to be a complete f- floodgate of just information and wanting to talk about it because for some people it's their form of therapy yeah. and and also I can imagine like awareness as well because if someone has passed away and there's circumstances where it's looking a bit you know suspicious to show that aware you know they if personally if that happened to me I would want to talk to a journalist to get the story out there to share awareness so I suppose you know I was going at it from one end but actually you can flip it over and think some people will actually really appreciate you know that um those questions as well Mm. it very much depends on the individual and as i was saying it feels very it's an incredibly delicate thing to have to balance and it's not an enviable task on either side like at the end of the day it's tragedy and it's trauma and i feel like the main problem between the old guard and the new guard of journalists this generation versus the versus the old generation of journalists past is the fact that as a generation we are more aware of different things triggering us and we're very quick to try and recommend help whereas for them unfortunately it must have been a lot more kind of a laugh and a joke situation where yes you end up on some level bonding over the fact that we've all just had to cover something incredibly hard or triggering or concerning but for us it's hey we should actually go and get help and not just bury our feelings in vices and whatever things which can can numb the pain for the day but don't actually it's like putting a 
plaster over a bullet wound. It's not going to really do much other than hide the wound temporarily. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's the biggest difference between the new journalists coming up like myself and the people now lecturing me because mm-hmm. they've clearly been affected by stuff. They just didn't really have a direct way of dealing with it unless they saw a shooting or a, you know, something that was genuinely unanimously considered tragic whereas now anything can trigger people and we're more aware of that as a generation so i feel like it's a lot more going out and actually saying hey i'm gonna go get therapy or i'm gonna decompress or take a week off because it's often some of the most impactful journalism that also impacts you as an individual (laughs) and that leads me on to my next question because I, I did mention about content creation, ease of access, and you are one of those people who've taken advantage of that as a content creator with a whole mental health page dedicated to people's well-being. And I just want to know about that, where you got the idea and kind of what it's been like for you using that page in combination with your training in psychology and your previ- previous experience as an undergrad. Mm. Well... The reason, I guess I created my TikTok to engage with people, just generally. Um, I didn't really post, and I've also had, like, a YouTube channel and, like, bits and bobs that I uploaded some content onto. Um, I feel like one of the reasons, one of the things that was really beneficial was uh, speaking about my experience first, second, third year of uni, how to write essays, um, what to expect from my experience, because, um, you know, I didn't live at uni, so I kind of had a a different experience at university compared to other people, maybe. Um, And I think sharing that was great, because I liked the academic side of uni. And then I think... um, the other side of it, which was sharing kind of, you know, there were a lot of changes going on and um, just general stuff. It, it wasn't anything, you know, really heavy um, because I didn't have anything heavy to share. But I think um, the one thing that I would never want anyone to feel like is is on their own. And uh, quite a lot of, you know, mental health disorders like anxiety can have derealization, depersonalization, and they are quite scary if you don't know what they are. Um, And there's a lot of things that I share that I haven't gone through myself and I'm sharing awareness about. But I also think, um, you know, we all know how it feels to feel that feeling of relief you know, relief about, oh, thank goodness they had the meal deal I wanted, or thank goodness, like, I didn't miss the bus. That feeling of relief of, like, you know, it's not so heavy anymore is, I think, the best feeling ever. Um, So I think if I could provide that to someone, that was the purpose of the account. And just to be very open, um, and and I definitely think I, I made it, uh kind of um relatable because i didn't want to trigger anyone by going too deep into certain things or you know it was just a a way for people to feel like you know oh she's you know she's doing this and this and this because i feel like you know i graduated i worked really hard yes i got a first class yes i got a job straight after and all this kind of stuff but you know, because we spoke about this, like, when we were going through it all, it was hell. Like, at, <laughs> like you know, summer, most of summer was literally sat on my laptop, interviews. Da, 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 da. So I think linking to the social media aspect of it, I think it's, it is still so easy to look at someone's social media or LinkedIn and think, how have they, how have they got all of this? And why don't I have this? And I think when people see actually how how stressful it was and I do put a lot of pressure on myself which is one of the things I need to get better at um but is seeing the the realness of 
of everyone. I think that is something that I pride myself in is being open and real. And that was the account was a, a way of doing that. But um, like I said, I had boundaries on that account with what I spoke about and um, things like that as well. Um, but just a way to be open, I think, and um, help other people, not just with their well-being, but academically as well. Hmm. So, um, yeah. I feel that that is an incredible thing to do where people will create pages related to whatever they're interested in. You see it oftentimes with, you know, fitness coaches and whatnot. They, or at least the ones who are worth paying for, I guess, will often, you know, they will talk about, hey, what exercises are the best, but they'll also talk about, you know, experiences that they've been through. And from the coaches I've been privileged enough to speak to and the personal trainers I've been lucky enough to speak to, it appears that it always has to come from a very genuine place in order to push the content out that they might initially be scared to push or the kind of concepts and stuff they want to talk about with such passion and vigor. It has to come from this place of, I genuinely want to see this person get better, even slightly, whether they buy a yeah. program from me or not, whether they but like buy my link or whatever, like however they make money aside, there always has to be that genuine sense of, I want to help people. And I feel like with journal, no, I feel like um, with journalism, yes, TikTok, social media is a ever growing thing, especially in journalism, where there's a lot more stories that are specifically that have to be specifically designed or created in a way to fit social media, to work with whatever social media platform they're being posted to. However, like mentioning the old guard again, the previous generation of journalists are. St- by their nature, very standoffish. They have separate accounts where, you know, it's Mark Jones one, the regular person, then Mark Jones journal on the other side. And it's like, for me as Gen Z, I guess, it feels very, that doesn't make sense because Mm -hmm. Mark Jones is still going to go into that, like, sorry, Mark Jones is still going to go into that interview and be himself, just a perfect, like a slightly more professional version of himself. The two don't leave each other, in my opinion. And yeah, I feel like you just so- control you control how much you let in from each side. That is mm. you know. and oftentimes within journalism now, that's with younger journalists I'm seeing. It, you see it on Twitter as well, because Twitter is incredibly performative for journalists. And God almighty, I will tell like you've probably heard me complain about this a number of times, where you just feel this sense of impending doom because every 30 seconds it's breaking news. I got this job with the BBC or Sky News, or I'm now a reporter with this publication. And it's like, for someone who just left uni, it's like, can you shut up? (laughs) Like, please? (laughs) Yeah, I know. It is it is hard. I think that's something that even no matter where you're you're coming from, no matter how much experience you've had, it is competitive to move on after university. It's it's so competitive because you're kind of you're competing not with current graduates, it's also maybe mature students who are coming back or, you know, there is a lot of competition and that can really make you feel like um you know it can make you feel bad about yourself because you're comparing and you're thinking actually am I doing enough am I am I even doing the right thing you know um and I think as long as you know that it would add will add to the end goal then you're doing the right thing and I think like you know it's it's hard because I also like I've watched a lot of podcasts and read a lot of articles that say that our generation is kind of like those in you know uni or just graduated they kind of want everything now and they want to have everything done before they're 23 or they're a failure or you know and I know that sounds you know maybe silly to say now but you really do get in that in that headspace because actually when you're going through all these things and if you get rejected, you you internalise that and think there's something going on. Um, but it is true. And I think that's something that I personally am currently having to uh, get through and learn how to deal with is competition because um, 
yeah, it, it's it is a thing. It's hard. Yeah, I honestly I feel you on that because I obviously we know I did broadcast journalism as an undergrad and now I'm doing it as a master student to in the hopes of you know getting a job in the future and nailing it. But there was a part of me throughout the summer. Again, I probably did complain to you about this at nauseum about my many anxieties about the fact I'm going in as someone who technically should already know this, but has to relearn at a higher level to make himself that little bit better. And you're in a constant sense of competition. You mentioned pressure very early on. How about, and like, I feel like our generation puts this pressure on us because we see the mistakes of every generation before us at the tap of a button. And we can see where, you know, not being quick enough to find things and not being quick enough to find a way to network or establish yourself can kind of leave you in a bind. So I understand, like, there's an understandable reason why we always are, why we always have this sense of pressure, but we have to have this point of separation where yeah. I can only do so much because I am a human being. Yeah. And I feel like that's what our generation lacks because people have this misconception of people in our generation that we're either really lazy but want everything now or we just we just want the easiest thing possible and we just don't and we don't want to worry when the truth is we have the same ambitions and goals as every other generation prior to us or every other recent generation prior to us but it's just because there's so many different ways of going about it and yeah. now there's also so many new pressures that the other generations didn't have social media being one of them. Yeah. It makes it very difficult to know just how far you want to go to pre to try and go for your dream. Because yeah. is your dream job really worth you never being able to sleep properly again? Are you having to constantly have a massive breakdown in your car before you walk into work the next morning? And I feel like our generation is good at realizing like that balance some of us but then there's also those people who unfortunately are very much living up to that stereotype where they will whine and complain and cry about things not going their way but never put in the work to get past that certain point mm -hmm. and it's a delicate balance really because we have yeah. both oh i think we have one more than the other we have the productive side of our generation more than the slightly less productive but we have both within our generation and that's a very un that's a very difficult thing to try and get across to talk to previous generations about because a lot of them will only see it as one side or the other we're either rushing or we're not moving fast enough to even get anywhere close and this has gone on for 35 minutes so i'm going to try and get to my next question with with content creation in the space that you're in psychology mental health therapy that sort of area what do you think it will be like in the future do you think more people w who are studying those things who are, who are genuinely educated on those topics are they going to take up more use of social media are they going to maybe withdraw some social media a bit more because of the ease of access for those who aren't educated what do you think the landscape of the side of social media that you're on will look like in three to five years time well i would hope that therapists that are qualified will have their own page um just to share their interests, share what their method, their models, share, you know, what they're about as a therapist, because there's loads of different types. Um, I, I think that would allow for free resources to be handed out. Um, but I also think personally for me, I think I will naturally you know, because obviously I have my personal accounts, I think I can see myself moving away from the personal a bit more and feeding more into my professional accounts. Um, but then I would say that because I've currently created a website as an academic portfolio, and I think people will create websites for private therapy. I think... Um, it will be a client-based personal uh, referral. Um, I hope that is the case. I think I would love to see a lot more therapists. That's just one potential issue I've found within the counselling psychology world at the moment. The courses are very in ha at very high demand. 
and there's there's not enough spaces in my opinion you know these i would love for counseling psychology to be broadened out broadened out broadened out is that a word made Go for bigger it. Go for it. um like because th- there's not an, you know there's a lot of students getting rejections because they don't have the places they don't have the facilities they've people have got all these great ideas but they don't have these unis don't have enough lecturers yet you know it's not mm. that they don't and I, I I would just really like to see more people. I would love to see more people with doctorates. I would love to see more lecturers and supervisors. This time in three years, I want the spaces for these courses to double so that um, there's more people creating these social medias of, look, I'm here. You know, I'm here. And even if they just create a social media and a couple people each day visit it and they know someone's there to listen to their issues, even if they never talk to them, they're like, oh, well, someone's there. That is just a tiny step in someone's brain to think, oh, someone's there for me. Even if, you know, it's just the small things, especially if someone really needs that. I think it's a nice private way of engaging with something that you may feel like you can in real life. Mm. Um, in conclusion, I want to see a lot more therapist accounts. I want to see it. I want to see loads of it. I, just, I mean... I feel like that's an obvious answer from a trainee, but like, I I just want more. I I want more people because um, it's hard to get in. It's hard to get into because of the spaces. So mm. I would love to see more social medias because that would be evidence to me that actually these institutions have the facilities to open up for more students. That is what is needed, and I, that's something I've realised. I feel very similarly about journalism, to be fair, because I feel like even if you are someone who generally, you know, keeps a somewhat private life, having a a social media, some level of a social media presence that says, hey, I'm a human being before anything else, because obviously in journalism, you are open to trolling, racism, sexism, all these different things that people will come at you for, especially because no one, it's a thankless job, unfortunately. So we will be open to a myriad of abuse. And I'm only I can only look forward to that, I guess. But I feel like on some level, you need more journalists to have a social media presence of them being themselves because it makes it easier for me, the individual, to want to come forward and yeah, help you with a story or try and add to your story if you're looking for specific people. And the more of us that do, it makes us look a lot less robotic. It provides us transparency and this ability to understand what we actually do versus you know your random person who cares about some aspects of media or journalism and as a tiktok because they're two different people one's one is professionally trained and understands this on a very deep level of ethics and law and whatnot the other is just someone who has an interest and isn't really held to any particular standards so they can do whatever and i feel like the more of them that do have a social media be it professional just one that shows more of who they are as an individual the easier it will be for people to realize that hey there's a human behind this this is this isn't just someone who's on some teleprompter reading off a script although some of it is scripted but these are still real people finding real stories and bringing them out and being the filters of the world that help you see things for what you when you need to see them and find a way of showing you the difficult things when most people wouldn't have a clue yeah yeah and to wrap this up or to attempt to wrap this up (laughs) (laughs) oh god what are some of the problems you encounter as a or are having to prepare to encounter as a therapist counselor and Gosh, I almost forgot. My, I think I've almost forgot my last question, but oh. bring it back, bring it back. <laughs> give me a second. All right. So, what are the future? What are the problems you are preparing to face as a counselor, and what are your ultimate goals as a therapist, as a counselor? Okay, so I'm preparing to apply my what I've learned in training about boundaries, limits of help. And I think that's something really important. And what that means is, say I specialise in CBT, for example, cognitive behavioural therapy, which is used for anxiety and other disorders. Um, If someone's coming to me, for example, 
with menopause and they're, they're struggling with anxiety, but actually they're having physical symptoms of menopause, hot flushes, headaches. I cannot help that. That is a limit to my ability. And I would need to then say, refer them to a GP or X, Y and Z. I think that's something really, really important that I've learned and that I wish to apply to avoid um, unethical practice and also um, not trying to take everything on because I cannot. Um, and I think the other challenge is um, is allowing my passion for it to be a passion, but at work, that is where I am at work on it. If I want to take it home, I take it home as a, as a you know, the theory, as a hobby. I think um, it is a lot, you know, there is going to be a lot of aspects that may be emotional. You're going to naturally relate to things and you're not going to relate to things because we're all different. We don't all have the same experience. Um, I think it depends on the clients. But overall, I think I am really, you know, I'm going to apply the limits to my practice, making sure that I am aware that I cannot do everything all the time because I'm one person who's trained in one specific thing. I don't know all of that and I don't know all of this. And that's like brilliant to admit because you shouldn't be trying to help, every, you know, if you cannot. Um, and in the future, I hope to, in the near future, finish my level two and three. Um, and I will have a year's worth of experience working in a mental health school and I have one-to-one -one clients for adult mentoring. So I would like to finish that and then move on to a uh, counselling psychology doctorate level programme. Um, and I have my research uh, interests around my PhD thesis are women in menopause, um, autism spectrum disorder, uh, in relation to their perceived wellness within their trainee contract as a counselling psychologist and also um, ethnic minorities, LGBTQIA um, and really filling those gaps in the literature that actually, you know, they'll, they know this and this and this, but actually 87% were, were Caucasian. So, you know, let's, let's open that up a bit. Um, and yeah, I really want to have a career where I can confidently add to the world of counselling psychology, but also um, continue in life to make mistakes and, uh, you know, be a person at the end of the day with a client. You know, if I don't understand something they've said, ask them about it. I don't, I am, I may be one day, hopefully a professional, but there is always room for people to challenge me. And no matter what level I'm at in a company or a private practice, always come and challenge me. That is what I never want to stop. So yeah, <laughs> that's me. Mm. That sounds really, really good. I want to say mm -hmm. thank you for coming on. Thank you for having this conversation with me. And that's I wish okay. you nothing thank but the you. best. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. No problem.